Welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome to today's Cecil webinar. Can give folks a few minutes to filter in. Um, but very nice to see you today from all around the country and looking forward to an engaging presentation today. Let me officially kick us off. Hello and welcome to you all. Thank you for joining the Center for Success of English Learners today for this 60-minute webinar entitled Academic Language, Making Space for Student Voices. The Center for the Success of English Learners, or CECL for short, is funded by a five-year grant from the Institute of Education Sciences within the U.S. Department of Education. CECL is currently undertaking a focused program of research aimed at identifying and removing barriers for English learners related to school tracking through analysis of, of administrative and newly collected data using a mixed method approach. The purpose of this 2022 webinar series is to disseminate research-based information to practitioners, researchers, and policymakers that will support improved opportunities and outcomes for English learners in secondary school settings via this series of virtual webinars. The webinar has been recorded and will be posted onto cecilcenter.org immediately after this event concludes. If you should need it, there's closed captioning and available. If you press the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen, it will turn on. I would also like to point out that the Center for the Success of English Learners is providing this event as a public service. However, the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed belong solely to the persons expressing them and do not necessarily represent the views of the Center for Success of English Learners. My name is Kira Valentine. I am the Vice President for Programs and Development at the Center for Applied Linguistics, and I'll be your host and moderator today. During this webinar, we encourage you, the audience, to ask us questions via the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen, and we'll um, save your questions and address as many as we can at the end of our discussion today. We also have a chat button. Please click at the chat button on the bottom of your screen at any time to share your thoughts and comments, but you go ahead and try it if you tell us, um, you want to tell us in the chat where you're calling in from, and also we'd love to know what your role is so that our presenters can understand who they're talking to today. Um, and then finally, before we begin, please be sure to mute your microphone now to avoid any interruptions during the presentation. Um, I want to take a moment to introduce our guests today. I'm so pleased to introduce to you um, three presenters today, all affiliated with the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, Catherine Snow is the Patricia Albjörg Graham Professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Paula Uccelli is a professor of education, and Gladys Aguilar is a PhD candidate in the human development, learning, and teaching strand, also at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Thank you for joining us today to talk about this important topic, and I am going to turn it over to Catherine Snow to lead us off. Thank you, Kira. Um, so, uh, let me uh, also welcome you and reiterate the request to let us know where you're coming from and what, what you do, why you're interested in this, in this topic. I don't see anything in chat yet. It makes me wonder if chat is open uh, for, um, for participants. Um, but let me get started by just uh, reiterating the title of this, um, of this webinar, Academic Language Making Space for Student Voices. Uh, and I'll tell you the backstory of that. Uh, when the topic, when the idea first came up that I would do this webinar, um, I said, well, okay, I want to do it on the topic of academic language, and I want to invite my colleague Paola Uccelli to do it with me because she knows so much more about this topic than I do. And Paola said, oh, I don't know, academic language, it's kind of a controversial term. It's kind of, it generates lots of acrimony, maybe we shouldn't call it that. And I, why don't we call it making space for student voices? Well, I'm all in favor of making space for student voices, that's fine. But on the other hand, I really did not want to back down from the idea of using um, the term of academic language just because some people think 
it's um, somehow uh, dangerous or offensive. So let me start by asking you, Paola, what's, what's wrong with the term academic language? What is academic language and how do people, why do people object to it? Hi, everybody. It's so fantastic to be with all of you today. And you have gotten a little bit of an insight of my conversations with Catherine throughout my uh, career, which, you know, Catherine has been my main mentor. And before I answer her question, I just would like to say that Today, we're trying to focus on the insights from both research and practice that inform pedagogies driven by equity and high quality learning for multilingual uh, students. And I just wanted to start by, by sharing the assumption that we all share in this panel that we are all language learners. We continue to learn language as we learn to do new things with language, right? If you yo join a yoga community with its own uh, words and phrases, or if you join an environmental club with its own jargon or a new job, and educators, and we are all educators here in this uh, panel, also learn a lot of language from our students. And for those of us who have kids or grandkids, we also learn a lot of language from uh, young people. That is, of course, when we are uh, lucky to be allowed into, into their communities and to learn from them. But so this is, you know, I think a starting, an important starting point uh, to, to clarify at the beginning. And when it comes to academic language, to Catherine's uh, question, Indeed, there are lots of misunderstandings in research and practice about what academic language means. And one of our goals today is precisely to try to clarify those uh, misunderstandings that indeed have often led to deficit-oriented and harmful practices. So many in the field today are opting not to use that uh, term to help debunk those misconceptions. So some of us, even in this panel, might opt to use the term precisely to clarify it. Some of us might choose not to use the term precisely to clarify it. So we have different uh, options in what the term, what terms uh, we use. But the important uh, piece here for us today is to understand the construct itself, whatever we label it, right? What we're trying to think about is to focus on how best to support students' language so that they can succeed in school literacy and content area learning. We can, we can choose any term to refer to that, but how to support multilingual students' language development so that they can succeed in, in being skilled readers, skilled writers, skilled learners of scientific, scientific uh, content. And what we're going to share with you today are insights, both, as I said, from research and practice that can inform equitable and high quality um, pedagogical practices. So Catherine, do you want me to go into the features, I guess, of uh, what academic language is and what is not, right? And Let's start by saying many people conflate. They think academic language is the same as standard English, but actually that is a misconception. When we are talking about the language that supports literacy and content area learning, we are thinking about a collection of language resources that are useful to support scientific communication and learning. So for example, we can think about the connectives um, Therefore, however, they are not um, restricted to standard English. They can be used with any variety, standard or non-standard. Uh, and they are resources that are helpful to clarify and communicate ideas. And so relatedly, the second point is that when we think about supporting this language um, for students, this is not a prescriptive approach. And what do I mean by that? It's not an approach that is trying to correct grammar, to correct pronunciation, to focus on forms. To the contrary, this um, approach to support students' language development comes from functional approaches. And what does that mean? That means there's a lot of research that has tried to identify 
the features that are helpful when we talk about scientific content and ideas. And by scientific, I mean broadly social studies, um, sciences, the natural and, and biological sciences, and also the humanities, content area learning in general at school. So there's a long tradition of studies in linguistics and language development that identify which are the resources that skilled readers, writers, and scientists use to communicate um, this content. And this is the focus, not on correction, but on meanings and ideas that we um, have uh, learned to identify that can support students when they read text and write um, text. And relatedly, very important, this language is not meant to be a prerequisite for content area learning. Oftentimes we, we hear that students need to reach a level of English proficiency before they can move to content area learning. But in fact, if we think about social studies, it's only in the interaction with social studies texts, with social studies content, that kids will learn that language because language is used in different ways when we are trying to accomplish different purposes. And so that is a critical uh, piece and relates to the other two final points, which is academic language is not meant to be superior or a replacement of how uh, students or all of us talk outside of school. It's just useful for some purposes and some contexts, and actually inseparable from all the other language resources that we use um, throughout life and different contexts. So it's not meant to be uh, a separate category or to be dismissive of students' uh, oral language resources that they use out of school. Actually, it's merged with those and it can only be learned by building on students um, already known language. Has Thanks. That um, so uh, I let me uh, just bring Gladys uh, Aguilar into this conversation because although she is now a researcher uh, with us at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, she also has um, background in practice as a bilingual teacher. And so she knows more about how these ideas get played out in the classroom than either Paola or I, because we have not been in uh, elementary classrooms uh, trying to, or, or secondary classrooms trying to um, work with these ideas. So Gladys, what, how would you respond at thinking about the relevance of these ideas to classroom practitioners? Yeah, and I, I would, add, uh, Catherine, that um, you and Paola, though, are educators, because I think some of these principles would apply for educating adult learners, right, or young adult learners, which you and Paola definitely do at, um, at the ed school. So I would say that um, you are as knowledgeable in terms of practice. Um, although, yes, I do have experience um, in the elementary classroom and working with multilingual learners, right, and teaching in bilingual classrooms. And I would say that it is very common for us to confuse academic language and the different features and its affordances with instructing our students about correct grammar or emphasizing the use of standard English, because that's what we think we have to do. And I think that there's some curricular resources out there and maybe even you know some educational leaders um, that maybe have that conflation, right? That trickles down to our impression as teachers as to what is important to teach in language and literacy development. And so I remember as a new teacher starting off um, the grammar lessons I was expected to teach by my district telling my students, well, friends, I find grammar as boring as you. And but you know what? Let's try to find ways to put a little fun into it. However, no matter how much fun a grammar lesson was, the skills I try to teach my students rarely transfer to the other aspects of reading and writing. Um, and so I've learned since then that it has more to do with teaching students about how language works, how the authors of school texts use language and to teach them that one of the main purposes of language is to communicate ideas and that communicating ideas is more important than following grammar rules. 
And I think that's one of the key principles of academic language, at least as we envision it in this webinar. And one of the key principles that's been used in the creation of, of the world generation curriculum that um, Catherine is gonna go into. Relatedly, when thinking about um, our multilingual learners, our emergent bilinguals, as I see some of you um, uh, use that term as well, emphasizing that as teachers, we're more interested in their ideas, whether they're you know, young students or adult students, and in what they have to say, than in how correctly or incorrectly they apply grammar or standard English rules can make a huge difference in our difference in our students' motivation to learn, in their self-confidence, in their identity as, you know, as learners, um, but also in their trust in us as, as teachers. And as you know, you know, that trust um, between teacher student is huge, right? In terms of affecting learning. And that brings us then precisely to this issue of student voice, because if students trust us, then they will talk to us and to each other in ways that reflect what they're thinking and how they're thinking and lead to the potential to improve the uh, precision and quality of thinking. So the the um, to, just to get to the C cell uh, work for a minute so you know what the background is to what we're talking about here. Um, as, as Kira introduced, C cell is a project. It has many strands to it. One strand is developing curriculum, uh, content focused curriculum, not language curriculum. This is curriculum to teach social studies and to teach science. I'm going to focus on the social studies today, but um, recognizing that teaching the complex ideas that are central to either social studies or science re requires um, certain ways of using language and making sure that we give students access to those big ideas using whatever language resources they have while at the same time expanding those language resources. And by whatever language resources they have, I mean uh, that it might it might be nonverbal communication, it might be another language, it might be um, a very non-standard variety of, of English, it might be, but those resources are how what the ones students use to think and to learn. And so that's where we want to start. But um, the, the curriculum is developed to both uh, help students uh, access the, the traditional language of school texts and also to help them learn the skills that they can apply in the future to such texts. Um, it, it, I've been working for, for 15 years on a program called Word Generation together with many colleagues at the Strategic Education Research Partnership. Um, and Word Generation had developed 18 one week unit, social studies units designed to promote uh, argumentation, reading comprehension, and language skills by engaging students in discussions about big and important ideas. That curriculum is an open resource curriculum. It's available to everybody. Um, Kira can put the link to it in the, um, in the chat. You can all get it. You can download it. It's free. You have to register. That's all. Um, and it was kind of the basis for Sharon Vaughn and Letty Martinez's work um, developing a, an adapted version for, um, for DLLs, for multilingual, for emergent multilinguals. Um, it's different in various ways, but this is still the experimental version. It's still being tested out. But the key elements are the same. Big ideas, really interesting, engaging ideas, um, a debate and discussion uh, regularly introduced. Um, but at the same time, some, uh, some efforts to make this more accessible to students whose English proficiency is still developing. So for example, I'll just give you a little hint of this. The word generation version deals with this topic where the Egyptian pharaohs wise investors or wasteful spenders um, in a one week, five day unit um, with a fair amount of text in it. Um, the world generation version of that 
takes the same content, spreads it out over two weeks so that students have more time to process it, uh, more time to discuss, more time to, uh, to write about it. Um, and it also provides more background information. In word generation, we started with a reader's theater. This is a group of kids discussing this important question of whether the school with its excess funds should build a pool or not, a very expensive Olympic style pool, whether that was a, a wise investment um, and expressing different arguments in favor or against. Um, the world generation version gives the students uh, some time to explore a couple of uh, websites with some guiding questions so that they get more background information about Egypt and about the pyramids before moving on to discussing these, um, these ideas about what a wise investment or, or a wasteful uh, uh, leader might be. Um, so a, a key element of this cur curriculum as of this curriculum of both word and world generation is this idea of student voice, that students talk and learn through talking, through discussion, through uh, debate. So I'll, um, I'll turn it back to Paola to ask um, how, this, how, the, how you see this working in, um, in this particular case, the student yeah. voice side, uh, the academic language. Great, thanks, Catherine. And I just want to emphasize two key ideas. First, the idea that Gladys brought that teaching grammar isolatedly is not transferred to the practices, the um, school practices of reading and writing and learning. And so embedding that a teaching in authentic practices is very, very important. And the second idea that you were um, sharing, Catherine, that it's truly about supporting the learning of big ideas in content areas and paying attention to language. So language is not the main goal. Language is a supportive a means to get to the bigger goal of understanding and expanding knowledge. Um, and I think another piece that is a very important is that a major instructional challenge is also to create opportunities for students to adopt their identities as scholars, to feel that they want to invest time and effort in learning content and language that for many might actually feel very foreign or associated with historical political factors and power disparities where they don't see themselves reflected either in the scientific practices or the ways of using language that we are um, trying to socialize students uh, into. And so how, how do we create conditions for students to feel that they belong, that they are valuable contributors to knowledge construction? And I think part of the answer that this curriculum and in general these practices uh, offer include situating them at the center as active knowledge constructors, right? And that about issues that they care about. And so that means opening plenty of spaces for their voices, welcoming their language and language resources, allowing opportunities for collective problem solving and making scientific learning relevant via these big questions that are a, being a, offered for a debate and situating their knowledge, their background knowledge, their cultural identities, the issues they care about as assets to understand, to construct, to contribute to understanding. So in this curriculum, this is, um, and, and this could be transferred of course, to so many other practices in school to offer a big open-ended question for debate. At the end, we need to socialize the students that knowledge is not fixed and, and limited and everything is solved. I think they're very aware that everything is not <laughs> solved, but we have to present that in school in a way where they can feel part of a knowledge constructors and, and understanding a society. And so it seems critical to have this participation structures where all students uh, can voices 
are welcome and listened to respectfully and deeply. And in that context, then we also need to scaffold the specific language resources that are helpful for reading, writing, and learning in the content areas. But as we said before, and I think we're gonna repeat throughout this, this webinar, language can only be learned when you are building on what you know, like all knowledge. We cannot learn almost anything without building on what we know. So it's only by welcoming and by building on students already known language and multiple languages that we can uh, support that. And so one of the, as an example, one of the features in this curriculum is that students might be allowed to debate in their own language. Right, if it's Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Vietnamese, they could discuss in their own language and then report to the class um, in English. And it's again, we uh, uh, as educators, and we are all, I think, in 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 you know aware of this constantly. We need to be careful to listen to students' ideas and meanings uh, first. And in that, supporting them with the language resources. So the sentence starters here are sort of a springboard so that they can engage in authentic uh, debates that are at the core of this social studies uh, curriculum. So the participation structures and then the language scaffolding embedded in those um, authentic practices. Right, with the and focus on the content, not on the on the language as a primary. So Gladys, um, thinking back to your days as a classroom teacher, how, how easy is this to use home language, to have students use their home language, particularly in cases where there might be multiple languages in the classroom? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Um, that's also a great question. And I, I did wanna emphasize that even though right now we're talking about social studies and we're talking about reading and writing, just this idea of validating students' cultural and linguistic background. Um, and that of their families and welcoming the use of their languages and their existing language skills is something that as a principal is, is very important in math and in other content areas, right? Um, and I would say across the ages in our different educational levels. And also it does seem more like a challenge, right? To, um, to incorporate students' home languages, especially if we ourselves don't share um, our, our students' language. Like I remember that in one of my Spanish English bilingual second grade um, classes, I had a student that, that spoke Nahuatl. And, and that's, that was this student and, and his, it, they were twins, boy and a girl, th their family's home language. Um, but in a way, finding ways to incorporate this, um, these linguistic resources that they bring um, makes our job a little easier and they're learning more effective. Um, and in learning new content and in understanding their texts and in communicating their ideas. Um, and the secret is finding ways, right? Um, to, uh, for them to leverage these linguistic resources um, in the classroom. And so one way, um, which is that this one is um, easier said than done is having resources or materials available um, in the students' home language that build their background knowledge about the theme or content um, of a lesson and a sister curriculum of World Generation. And I think um, they've shared the links in the chat of Word Generation for the elementary school years has some of these resources in, in, um, in Spanish, in Arabic, in Mandarin, um, what other languages? Um, Vietnamese. Uh, Catherine, Vietnamese, okay. And so if the curriculum has these um, resources, great. If not, I think that we can advocate for um, makers of curriculum to, to make these uh, resources um, available in other languages that represent um, our, our, our population, our student pop multilingual population, but even um, having non-curricular resources available to build the background knowledge or, or, um, or to bring across key points um, in our lessons, such as um, using a video. Um, and Catherine is you know, gonna talk about this lesson about the Egyptian pharaohs and um, having a video about these pharaohs in Egypt and how pyramids are built, having it available in Spanish or Mandarin and may not be exactly the same video, but that brings across some key ideas would be very helpful. And this is where working as grade level or subject area teams would be very helpful. So we can 
share and exchange resources and debrief on how they were helpful or not for our particular students. Also pairing students by shared home languages um, to discuss, read or write about a text can be very helpful. And a very useful tool um, that I think is often used in dual language classrooms is bridging, right? Showing students, making explicit for students how English, for example, and Spanish are related, for example, in prefixes or su suffixes. We assume that students will, wow, you know, know these relationships, but more often than not, um, they're not, and they're totally flabbergasted. Like, oh my gosh, look at that. If I you know, know how to spell educación or education, I can spell it in the other language, um, or I can say it in the other language and understand it in the other language. So bridging languages is just a really another key resource. Great. Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm sensitive to the fact that we're running out of time, and I don't want to miss the opportunity for you all to hear um, Paola's um, analysis. So we're going to go really fast. Um, Paola, why do so many students not understand the text they read at school? Well, and I, I think probably for this audience, this is a very uh, well-known uh, area. So truly what happens is that as many students bring their knowledge, their everyday knowledge to school, they also bring their ways of using language outside of school. And it is at school that they learn not only new content, but new ways of using a language in different content areas. Uh, and so if we can move to the next uh, slides, Catherine, uh, even to the next one, right? We need to think that, you know, students bring more conversational language and texts use language resources that might be unfamiliar to to many kids and so our hypothesis in you know we've been working on this for more than a decade was that well perhaps some of those language resources are not known even throughout adolescence and even for monolingual students. And so not only for multilingual students, but some of these resources our research has shown are also challenging for kids who are only speakers of English or actually only speakers of Spanish or of Portuguese. So the, the idea was that because prior interventions have focused on word recognition, sort of in the, in the next slide we, we show, that some interventions have focused on word recognition, reading comprehension strategies, vocabulary interventions, and all of those are absolutely important, but they seem insufficient, insufficient to move the needle towards a reading comprehension, a, particularly throughout the middle school years beyond for multilingual learners, eh, the, the basic eh, understanding of decoding and reading fluently and reading to learn from text, right? And so this was the idea that this would be challenging and supporting that would actually benefit not only eh, students designated as English learners, but all students. And so, but what exactly is this eh, language? And perhaps we can play the the video on the this is a video actually that Kira will play for us that is embedded in the in the curriculum that Catherine was sharing which is all about e Egypt and and the pyramids and the big question is related to this but so listen to this as a, as a piece of language thinking about what's tough about understanding it perhaps yeah. can you see can you see the screen Yes. Yeah. With the YouTube? All right, let me know if you can't hear the sound. Question that's plagued scientists for decades. How the heck did the Egyptians build the pyramids? I can barely build a Lego house. Hey everyone, Lacey Green here for DNews. The Egyptian pyramids are one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and humanity has been wondering. How on earth did these ancient people manage to move two and a half ton stones and statues across the Valley of the Kings without the help of any modern equipment? I've heard theories ranging from specialized ramps to aliens doing it. When in doubt, aliens. But that wasn't good enough for scientists and they kept digging on only recently to discover the embarrassingly simple answer. Water 
and saying. Dutch scientists believe that the Egyptians likely carried the blocks on sleds pulled by hundreds of workers. The sleds were little more than giant wood slats with upturned ends. As the sled moved, they would pour the water in front of it to ease the sliding friction of the sand. By pouring just enough water onto the sand, they cut the force required to move the sled in half. An international team based out of Amsterdam tested the theory using downsized models in a lab. They found that the ratio of water to sand was really important. Just like a sand castle, if you add too much water to the sand, you're gonna get a big pile of gloop. Optimal sand stiffness occurs when the water makes up about two to 5% of the volume of the sand. So we always knew the answer to the question of moving the blocks would be simple, but I'm not sure anyone saw an answer this simple coming their way. In the past, scientists have theorized the heavy blocks may have been moved up and down while building the pyramids with basic tools like rope and wood. And what's really funny is that for so many years, the answer has been right at our fingertips. A wall painting found in one of the tombs shows a worker pouring water in front of the sled as people pulled. Till now, Egyptologists mistakenly interpreted the painting as depicting an Egyptian purification ritual with water, not revealing the technicalities of one of humanity's greatest architectural accomplishments. So it just goes to show, even the most complicated and mysterious of life's questions are sometimes staring you right in the face. Thanks for joining me for DNews, everyone. If you haven't done it yet, check out our new sister show, Test Tube. It covers world events and other trending topics. Hit the subscribe button now and get that show in your inbox the same way you're getting DNews. I'll see you next time. Okay, so what you saw there, it's a video that clearly tries to engage uh, adolescents in this uh, question of how the heck did the Egyptians uh, build uh, the pyramids and tries to um, be very supportive with multimodal uh, resources to support that understanding. And as I hope you also were able to observe, there are lots of features that are typical of content area texts that are here that we're going to discuss. So what happens often is that we are so familiar with the content that we teach and the texts that we use that it's actually very hard to sort of take a distance and understand what features are challenging for kids. And so one thing that this video does, uh, that, that it shows that, of course, academic language resources are intertwined with many colloquial resources that Lacey is using in that, in that video, even by opening the, the, the content, right? But also by the fact that this is not an interactive conversation, there are features that are challenging, whether it's an oral text or a written text. So for example, you see all these um, references that are made to participants and themes, right? Because uh, we are elaborating, or in this case, Lacey is elaborating on a topic, participants and themes are referred to many times through different expressions. That is a challenge that is rarely encountered in interactional conversations and that is challenging for kids. So if we go to the next slide, um, Catherine, what we see is that, and we have worked with uh, many teachers who have used this strategy of giving kids different color pencils so that they can track participants. And so they can see that these ancient people refer to the Egyptians, and then that this Amsterdam team is the same as the Dutch scientists. But even beyond um, participants, you have objects, of course, where you have, you know, that the sled would be it, and just clarifying that for kids support understanding. But there is this additional feature of big ideas, for example, here, the theory, right? In this case, theory actually encapsulates an entire very complex idea that has been explained through multiple sentences. And students have to learn to sort of link that word with this complex idea that then they need to carry to continue to understand uh, the text. So interestingly, whether this is an oral or a written uh, text, because of the purpose of talk, because we are talking about scientific content and elaborating on topics, there are language resources that are 
typical to this way of uh, communicating, right? And so tracking participants and themes is one of the challenges that uh, students face in reading content area, uh, I mean, in even listening, but also reading content area text. Another feature that we can observe in this, in this uh, analysis are complex words. So what you see here in this text are a, um, nominalizations. What are nominalizations? That means verbs or adjectives that are turned into nouns. So from human, humanity, from a pure purification to accomplish, accomplishment. And what is interesting, what we know from research is that knowing humans does not necessarily support understanding humanity. But these forms are not just only to make discourse more complex, they actually allow for scientific discourse a level of abstraction and generalization that is helpful for scientific communication, right? So when here the text says humanity, it's not referring just to some people or some group of persons, it's actually referring to sort of the whole collective of humans. But these uh, complex words and these links between verbs and their nominalizations or adjectives and their nominalizations need to be scaffolded for, for students. And of course, these features interact with one another, right? So that you can see that at the end, that one of humanity's greatest architectural accomplishments, they have to link that back to the Egyptian pyramids in this, in this uh, text. So all of this makes for a lot of complex language in there. A couple of additional features are transition markers or connective. So here we don't have that many connectives in this text, but you have the use of as, right, in, in this text that has two meanings used in two different ways in the same text, and you have an entire collection of connectives like um, however, in contrast, consequently, that students often don't use in their conversations with one another, and they are used in text precisely to support conversation, but uh, to support understanding, sorry, but of course, they are going to support understanding only if students understand their function. And just teaching a list of them won't do. As Gladys was pointing out before, it needs to be practiced recurrently and um, across uh, modalities of oral language, reading and writing to sort of internalize this understanding. And finally, uh, another feature that emerges particularly in the middle school years uh, with particular attention uh, for, for reading is that scientists or writers or educators generally qualify what they say, right? This um, expression where it says Dutch scientists believe that Egyptians likely carried the blocks, doo -doo -doo, it's meaning that it's very probable, right? But it's not totally certain. And this is part of understanding how scientific knowledge is constructed and developed. And oftentimes uh, kids don't uh, know these terms or they don't know how they are used in scientific discourse and need support for that. So overall, you know, this makes for an entire complex constellation of features that make reading text a uh, challenging, but that can be taught. So if we go to the next slide, we can see all these features uh, together, right? That is the work that kids need to do. But again, what we are trying to show here is that those could be supported because these features that are listed here are present in many, many academic texts. And so it's an entry point to support language resources that will be useful for kids as they read academic texts across content areas, but they are useful as they are reading, writing, and learning the big ideas that the curriculum tries to um, teach. So that's a you know very quick overview of a few critical features of, of this way of um, language. Great. Um, I, I would love to hear from Gladys about how the this approach might be useful to teachers, but I'm very sensitive to the fact that we're actually out of time. And I do want to hear from the give uh, people a chance to ask questions. So I'm just going to put up this slide that has some of the, our crucial takeaways. 
and um, turn it back to Kira um, to monitor the uh, the questions in the in the um, Q and A. Or That's absolutely, we have the chat. Quite... There's wonderful uh, observations in the chat uh, too that people should uh, bring up if they're interested. We have some really rich questions. Um, I, I want to start off with one that's just a really practical one where, where someone's asking, so, you know, can students have a successful small group discussion in a science class where they bring their um, resources in both academic language and, and sort of their conversational, their, their um, you know, everyday language fluency? Can, how, do these, how do these registers work together hand in hand? Um, so let, me, let me pass that one back to the panel. Gladys, why don't you take that one? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, it's the question is about um, as students acquire academic language and have other language registers, you know, how can, you know, does it does it make sense for them to use them together hand in hand, say in a science class discussion? Most definitely. I mean, it's part of that whole principle of leveraging and encouraging, encouraging them to bring all their linguistic resources. So as they're learning about photosynthesis, for example, um, they can explain what it is um, using their, you know, their own linguistic resources. And definitely, you know, what we may term as less formal language or colloquial language um, um, is definitely, you know, part of what's important in helping them express their ideas or if they want to express their ideas in in writing or through a picture you know as Catherine said language is also about nonverbal communication and especially with our multilingual learners having them draw out their thinking um, or you know giving them a picture and having them explain it um, you know those are all ways of doing that and I think as teachers being models of how we can um, navigate and, and deploy our different linguistic resources, sort of like Obama does, right? Where he has in his speeches, academic language features, as well as, you know, some less formal language features. Um, I think that as teachers, we also, you know, need to make transparent to students that, yeah, you know, the way I, I speak with my friends or, you know, or with my mom or my dad, you know, suena así muy diferente, pero que chévere. Um, definitely, it's all about language and communicating what I'm trying to, to say, communicating what I'm thinking. Um, and I think that is definitely the case in terms of academic language and, and using their linguistic resources, um, their less formal language in debates and writing and reading and in discussing with peers. And I wanna say we saw a very nice model of that in that video, which as Paula talked us through had this you know, very rich academic language content, but starts out with the presenter saying, how the heck did they do this in this very kind of connective and informal register? Um, I, I want to ask, I have a couple of questions here where people are saying, hey, this makes a lot of sense to me. Um, it'll be beneficial to students, allowing them to use you know, their full um, linguistic repertoires. But I'm concerned that you know, at my district level, um, that other educators, administrators may not see the value. Um, can you speak to that? Do you, do you have ideas for folks that would like to bring um, a, a, a more assets-based perspective where students have the use of this full linguistic repertoire as an entree into academic language and how do you sell that to administrators who are not necessarily experts in language acquisition? I'll take a quick crack at that and then pass it on if people have other ideas. I mean, this is, of course, uh, always often a problem of many aspects of educational practice like having discussions, having lively debates, not something that the principal necessarily appreciates when he or she walks into the room and sees the kids um, talking in loud voices to each other. Uh, so I, I, I could counsel uh, extreme subversion as one approach, but <laughs> if that's not gonna work uh, or if um, then, I, I think it's important to point out the, a point that, that 
Paolo has been emphasizing, there is a strong research basis for this. And the research base is very, very clear that using the home language as a resource in not to substitute for learning the second language, but as a uh, resource in learning content and learning content as a context for learning new language skills, that that is the most efficient um, approach. It's much more efficient than trying to suppress the home language or trying to engage students who are quite uh, not quite low on proficiency in the language in which they are meant to be learning because the the distance is just too far at that point for them. So I I if people are in willing to um, consider the research base, then there's a lot of bit, there's a lot of strength in the research base supporting the position. And I I'm sure Cal has resources that would um, be could be made available I to. Think we can find a couple to, to send out to folks afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, um, Gladys, Paula, do you have, do you have any other perspectives on this question of, um, I, you know, I, I, I would only add that, you know, first of all, it's impossible to separate sort of colloquial language from academic language. Let me just say that straightforwardly, because it's a, we do this in research where we isolate something to study it better, to understand. So what are the challenging aspects in reality? That's all mixed, right? There is no clear delineation between one or the other. And for multiple languages, I think, you know, building on what Gladys said before, there's a lot that can be done even just providing a additional resources in multiple languages and even allowing students to talk to one another without the teacher uh, being necessarily the one uh, leading uh, that too explicitly, right? So hopefully I, I, I would have a have a hard time, although you know we can see all kinds of things these days. But not not allowing sort of multiple supports in multiple languages uh, for kids in the classroom. And the only other piece that is, I think, very important. One thing is the leveraging, right, of the learning. The other thing is the emotional connection. My daughter still remembers when she was asked to read a poem in Spanish in second grade. It was three. They, the teacher asked her to read three lines. That experience stayed with her forever. So sing a song or the recognition of who, who, who kids are and what they bring into the school is actually also emotionally quite um, critical. And if I could just add, Paola, that as I was listening to Catherine and, and you talk about this, I'm thinking there's a very big research base also that shows how um, integrate the relationship is between language and identity, right? And multilingual learners, especially from underrepresented communities, um, identity, um, self-worth and sense of self-worth, how it's tied to their heritage language and the way they perceive their parents, right? Um, you know, we're very aware of the social, political, social, cultural context, right? And I think being aware of our biases and, you know, of, of, biases that are present in the sociopolitical context is very important and students knowing that students are aware of it too and when we don't allow them to leverage these linguistic resources or find a place for it in their academic um, learning or their learning how to read and write and content learning then it's it it is silencing them and as re, as educators we care about the whole child right we're not just building readers and writers we're building human beings not building but we're facilitating the growth of them and i think that that is huge and so that is something that i would encourage you know all of us who are you know ed, leaders in education to think about right what is education and and you know in what ways are we serving our students in, and in what ways are we not? And the social, emotional, and identity aspect is huge. Gladys, you've, you've teed me up beautifully for the next question that I have here to ask. Um, so this person says, I find the biggest hindrance in my teaching environment for English learners in higher level AP and IB content area class is a stigma from those content teachers that their students need a certain level of English because those higher level content teachers don't have time to slow down and make accommodations for non-native speakers. Do you have any suggestions of how that person might um, approach these, this group of educators? Uh, 
I, I just say two words before probably Catherine will expand on that, but I think in this curriculum that that is being tested currently for a both for students who are in a classrooms or of only designated English learners and also students who are uh, in classrooms with English proficient kids, there are multiple scaffolds that are flexibly offered that some students can uh, use or some teachers can provide flexibly depending on, on the students' needs. I mean, I always think about Singapore actually where all students are learning English as a second language and the scaffolds and the attention paid to language in those uh, environments actually supports content area learning in an interesting way because at the end we learn through language mostly at school and so when you're careful about what language you use how to scaffold the language that is a uh, um, useful for content area learning, you are actually supporting the deeper understanding of uh, big ideas as well. But I, I think the, the danger is uh, how, how easy it is to tip the balance toward teaching language rather than teaching content. And it's a, it's a, it's a delicate equilibrium. Obviously, you have to teach about the language in which the content is expressed at some point. But if the major focus comes to be the language speaking correctly, using the right, using the right word for this, using the nominalization form rather than the adjectival form, then the centrality of the ideas that can really, that are really what engage students' interest gets lost. So yeah, we do have to do the support and that, I think that's part of the goal of this world generation curriculum to build in those language supports, um, but let it be a little bit, uh, I don't know, uh, camouflaged by the centrality of the content focused activities. Yeah, and connecting that to, again, this discussion about um, the home language use that engaging with complex ideas um, in a language that's a second language to me where I don't have as much vocabulary resources for that is going to limit, right, how much um, of my cognitive flexibility and my cognitive capacities I can apply to them if I'm allowed to discuss that content and learn that content in the language for which I have a wider, for example, um, vocabulary repertoire. So I think that that's very much connected. If I want my students to learn content well and ideas and concepts, um, and they have these linguistic resources from Spanish, Arabic, Mandarin, Vietnamese, then wow, and, and, and having them talk about it in that language is going to build that cognitive capacity and then content learning, then, then let's go for it. Let's make efforts to, to have those resources for students, welcome them and build on them. And, and what might be sort of counterintuitive is that it's actually immersing students in cognitively demanding <laughs> learning that is linguistically supported is actually the best way to learn language also. And it's a little bit counterintuitive. I think, you know, we tend to think we have to support the language and then move to the content. And actually what we have learned over the years is that it's actually in providing them with engaging and cognitively demanding where they are sort of embedded in that context and the support of the language is provided that they learn the language better. And you have something you want to do in the language because you're engaged with the content, exactly. you're going to learn the language to do it with. That's that whole functional, functional piece. Folks, we are pretty much at time here. I have had lots of folks ask in the chat about whether the session will be recorded. Um, and so I'm just rather than type back to everyone, yes, it will. Um, you'll be able to find it on the Cecil webinar. I believe we'll send you an email, uh, an email after the session with an evaluation form to fill in and you should get the information in there. So all that remains is for me to thank and give a round of applause to our three wonderful presenters today and also to thank my colleagues Althea Rowe and, and Hisham Al-Akti who are in the backgrounds here. You can't see their faces, but they have been working on some smooth tech for this uh, event. So thank you, thank you very much to them and to our presenters. Thank you.
Gracias a todos, todas, todes. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kira. <laughs>